Hello everybody, welcome to Making Sense of the Digital Society here at Auditorium Friedrichstraße in Berlin. Thank you Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society as always one part of this joint venture of this long running series and also Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, Federal Agency for Civic Education to um, host this event. Some of you probably already know how this is going to roll about here in the next, let's say, 90 minutes, maybe 100 minutes. After brief introduction, uh, there's going to be our guest giving his lecture, his talk. There's going to be, uh, let's say, about a quarter an hour of a one-on-one -on -one conversation where we get going here on stage a little bit, and then it's your turn, of course, too. Also at home, uh, if you're watching this on uh, whatever kind of screen, because it's streamed by Alex TV, as always, thank you for that also, and on the respective website of the partnering agencies here. There's a participatory tool called Slido where you can ask your questions if you want to. There's also here on site two microphones available for your questions and comments after our conversation has finished. So what does SMART mean? Part of our topic tonight here. Is it just another word for intelligent? The hot debate about artificial intelligence reminds us uh, of these very old questions, and of course the answers have changed over time, even in this uh, series running in its sixth year. We've had quite a few scholars, actually, I think, who basically said, oh, AI, or more specifically, generative AI, is statistics on steroids, you know, probability machines trained with very, very big data sets. In fact, these data sets are so exhaustive that the machines are running out of data to be trained on, which stalls what some fear now could be a fast growth towards a sentient machine. Things are going to go slower, a lot of our scholars here in this series said, than so-called doomers predict. There's not any general artificial intelligence coming anytime soon. The well is dry, said Gina Neff from Oxford just about a year ago here in this series. No more data, no more energy, not enough computing power even, uh, Gina said, and many of her colleagues agree. So is generative AI really intelligent? And I think this introductory remarks, I hope, do sort of tie in with what our guest will talk about today. Not because he's talking about AI, but the concept of the smart city. Many of us associated with all things digital in the city. Smart then means digital. And many Berliners, as you would know, would die for a city administration that would run more digitally. You know, say, get your passport renewed online without having to get up really early uh, countless times in order to phone in or fax in and maybe get an appointment at some district hall an hour away from where you live, if you're lucky. At least if you're German, that is, uh, in Berlin. I dare say it is a lot easier at the Swiss Embassy here in Berlin. Uh, also a lot more expensive, though. For Berliners with school children, the last pandemic would have been a lot easier with a citywide idea of how schools were going to cope, you know, software, hardware, how to address children uh, in distress and with no digital experience or hardware at home, instead of pretty much leaving it up to the individual teacher. But of course, there are countless aspects of the city, of the smart city that are always there without us even noticing things that work, you know, work for us, Private individual transport, for example, works not so well for the drivers, uh, you might say. We've talked about this in this series also. Or work for some other agency, the police, the public transportation authorities. Or work for both, we think. Think of smart ticketing uh, or car sharing, actually. We see that the word smart is part of a tricky play, like the word intelligent, that is so much in use these days. Does smart denote a technology? all things digital in a city? Or does it also want to apply a mysterious form of consciousness we call human? Or does smart simply mean high usability? What a lot of the tech firms, of course, um, provide. Now, if you're as confused or unsure about questions like these as I seem to be, you are just right tonight. For our guests, it's the person to tell us everything you always wanted to know about smart cities. How long do they go back? What did they once mean? What have they promised and still do promise? What are the perils? What very different things do they mean today? And also maybe if the term itself, smart city, is still able to capture the current 
practices and what is to be done to change what hasn't worked so well in the past. Our guest is from Ireland. He's a professor in the Social Sciences Institute at Maynooth University, for which he was director from 2002 to 2013. For those of you not too familiar with the geography of the Republic of Ireland, Maynooth is pretty easy. I, I believe the Irish actually pronounce it like that, right? They say Maynooth and not Maynooth, as some probably Americans or British would do. I hope I got that right. So Maynooth is about 25 kilometers from Dublin. Google says it's usually faster by train than by car <laughs> to get there to the city of Dublin. Uh, we will hear something about the smartness of an Irish train ride, train ride sorry, in a minute. His research examines the production of digital geographies and is present European Research Council ERC funded project until 2027 is called Data Stories, telling stories about and with planning and property data. He's the author and uh, editor, co-editor of 36 academic books and over 200 articles and book chapters, including the edited works Dialogues in Human Geography, Progress in Human Geography, and Social and Cultural Geography. Also, he's a recipient of the Royal Irish Academy's gold medal for the social sciences. But now he's here in the not always so smart city of Berlin. Please welcome Rob Kitchen. Right, thanks very much for the uh, welcome and for uh, coming along. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk for maybe about 40, 40 minutes or so on, on the theme of smart cities and how we make sense of smart cities and maybe how we rethink uh, them. Let's start with this. I need to turn this on. Okay, okay so this is obviously the title of the, of the talk. Um, so digital and cities goes back quite a long way. In fact, it goes back really to the start of computing. Uh, smart cities is just the latest incarnation of how we've gone about trying to uh, think about how we might use computing to improve how we think about, manage, govern uh, cities. So back into the 1950s, we're looking at SCADA systems, so uh, a computer kind of supporting around infrastructure, land use and transport modeling into the 60s and 70s first forays into cyber, cybernetics and urban modeling. Uh, and we start to see in the literature the idea of cybernetic cities. Into the 1980s, we start to see uh, municipal governments and so on using personal computers, using specialist software like GIS, starting to employ telematics and trying to run the road network and uh, other infrastructure. Into the 1990s, we start to see the deployment of the internet. So we start to see the first e-government, the first e-governance. Uh, extension of kind of networked infrastructure and we start to see the idea of uh, kind of computational cities or cyber cities uh, in the literature into the 2000s we're into the internet of things so it's things that are also connected to the internet not just uh, people so sensors and other computers and so on into the starting to get big data so real-time um, kind of exhaustive kinds of data sets starting to see the first kinds of machine learning and AI uh, being used in the literature, we start to see terms like digital cities, knowledge cities, intelligence cities, network cities, uh, and so on. And into the 2010s, we're into ubiquitous and pervasive computing. So that's computing being put into every all kinds of different kind of objects and networked uh, con connectivity being almost anywhere. So I can connect my phone or any digital device wherever I am, uh, pretty much. And I, find, and I can find software embedded into all kinds of different devices in my home that never used to have software in. Uh, and, and around the city. So this is not like just the last 10 years. This is part of a long process of using technologies to manage and govern cities. And these are the kinds of technologies I mean when I talk about smart cities. There's lots of different definitions of smart cities in the literature. But this is, I, I, my, my version of this basically is it's using, using network digital technology to manage and govern cities. And these are the kinds of technologies that are now uh, regularly in place in lots of cities. So it might be in relation to government and e-government systems, city operating systems, performance management systems, dashboards, into security and emergency, so centralized control rooms, digital surveillance, predictive policing, coordinated emergency response, into transport with intelligent transport systems, integrated ticketing, smart travel, bike share, real-time passenger information, 
And you can work your way down the rest of the list around energy, around waste, around environment, around uh, buildings and the kind of smart buildings um, into, into our own homes and the kind of uh, smart meters and various kinds of app control devices we might have in our own homes into this intermediating civic life through civic platforms, open data, uh, and, and so on. So these are some of these kind of technologies, I guess, uh, kind of visualized, if you like. So in the top uh, left there, we have um, a kind of big belly bins. So these are bins that have a sensor underneath the, underneath the lid that says how full uh, the bin is. And it basically, the garbage truck only goes to the bins that need emptying. It doesn't go to all bins, just goes to, and it has a dynamic routing. So it works out what's the most efficient route to go to the bins. That, so this is kind of saving fuel, it's saving time, uh, and so on. Uh, smart kind of uh, smart kind of building stuff down in the left, some smart kind of parking stuff in, in the middle, uh, kind of telling people which, which spaces are free and so on, but also you can book a space online through an app uh, and so on. And then things like lighting infrastructure becoming a lot more than just lighting. So we have a, we have a piece of infrastructure that has power. So not only can we do lighting, but we can think about putting sensors on there to monitor noise or pollution and so on. We can also put in lighting that we can control, so we can dim and trim it. We can put in video screens. We can put in uh, uh, other ways of connecting with it. We can make it into a Wi-Fi point. We can make it into a charging point for cars and so on. So we kind of smartify what was just a piece of technology with a light bulb. We can add digital services on top of that. This is the traffic management system in Dublin. I, there's a 100% chance that there's one in uh, Berlin. In fact, there'll be lots of these control rooms in Berlin for different types of uh, uh, infrastructure. So this is the Dublin one. So if you ever see the tar loops on roads, the tar loops are basically inductive loops. They're counting the cars and the gaps between the cars, the speed of the cars going over them. Uh, we also have 380 high-definition CCTV cameras. We have 100 radar cameras. We have all the push buttons at the uh, traffic stop. We have information that can come in from social media, so people can say, I'm on such and such a road, there's been a crash and there's a, there's a tail back and we're waiting. And all that information comes into the control room in the bottom right, so this is the view the operator has. Uh, the screen he can see in front of him with the four little boxes in green, they, they basically control the phasing of the traffic light, so how long you wait to go left or right or to go straight on. And basically all of this data coming from the inductive loops, the cameras and so on, is feeding into the system and automatically changing the traffic lights phasing. So as I go to a traffic light, I might wait uh, kind of um, 55 seconds to go through the traffic light. Toby might come uh, five minutes after me and wait 48 seconds and so on. So that, that it's not fixed phasing, it's always, it's always changing the phasing based on real-time data about the volume of traffic on the road. And it's an anticipatory system. So it's, it's basically trying to now cast, it's, it wants to, it, it, never, it doesn't want congestion to build up and then fix it. It wants to stop congestion happening. And that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to anticipate and, and stop congestion happening. So this is a real-time uh, system, but it's a human in-the-loop system. So it's automated. The software makes the decisions, but a person can override it. The controller can kind of override the system if they need to. And some of this data then obviously feeds up into these larger control rooms. So this is a kind of a selection of control rooms, and then this is kind of some of the kind of visual analytics uh, that are used uh, in them. Probably the most famous one in the literature is the one in the top uh, left. This is um, uh, the traffic. Uh, this is the uh, control room in Rio de Janeiro, uh, effectively built for uh, the World Cup, the Olympics, the Confederation Cup. They had a few big events there, uh, and so on. It has 32 agencies plus 12 concession companies located in the room. It works on a 24-hour. Uh, basis. It has 400 workers there, and it's pulling in all the data, real-time data related to traffic, to environment, to uh, emergency services, to security, to policing, uh, whatever, what, you know, waste management, whatever, is coming into here, and they're obviously using it to kind of direct things within the city. It also has a big media room at the back of this, so the minute a traffic accident happens, the journalist knows, they can see it on the big screen, and they can report real-time what's, what's happening in uh, the city. And there are a number of these control rooms. Uh, there's, there's almost certainly 10 plus in and around Berlin related to bus networks, train networks, energy networks, com communication networks, whatever it, whatever it might be. This is some of our own work. So 
you'll see I'm going to critique a lot of this technology, uh, but I do actually also build this technology. So we built the Dublin dashboard for the city uh, over a number of years. And then the, the 3D visualizations you can see here are part of our kind of city information modeling. So the top middle is Airbnb data. So this is a 3D virtual model of the city. Uh, the height of the pin basically is how much you pay per night. And the color of the dot is what kind of accommodation it is. And you can obviously fly or walk through this. You can click on any of the dots and it will tell you about it. So that dot I've clicked on, I can't say which one dot it is, but it's 2,000 euros a night, whichever dot I've clicked on uh, to stay there. Uh, you can kind of color code it. So the one in the middle is each individual building you can click on or query. So this is a, this is a building use. Uh, we also have a 3D printed model of the city, which is probably roughly the same size as the screen. Uh, you can see from the person in the middle kind of what size it is. So it's a 3D printed model and we can cast the data uh, onto it. And then we have a kind of a photorealistic model of the city. And we're using that to drop different bits of data in. So we can drop real time data into that. We can drop the buses in. You can see the buses moving around where they really are on the, or we can drop in the air pollution sensor data or whatever data you want. It's just a way of visualizing the data as a way to make sense of what's going on, which is trying to use visual analytics in uh, 3D. Obviously in the Dublin dashboard, it's in uh, 2D and includes more admin data rather than just uh, real time data. Okay, so that's some of the technology. So what are the kind of the promises, if you like, of the smart city? Like why are people promoting it? And, the, and these are the kinds of reasons, right? So the smart city is one that uh, allows a smart economy. It allows entrepreneurship. It turns the city into a lab. It turns the city into a test bed where we can try out different technologies. We can uh, you know, uh, do bits of innovation. Uh, we can uh, enable startups. We can uh, uh, maybe attract foreign direct investment in. This is, this is very much the Dublin, the Dublin model. There are five TED test bed districts in, in Dublin. If you move your company to Dublin, you, you basically can test your technology in a real place where real people live. Uh, they fund startup companies. They run procurement by challenge competitions where they'll give money to seed money to companies to help them develop new technologies with the aim of creating new jobs. It could be around smart environment. So we have this technology, we can move to green energy, we move to more efficiency, move to sustainability and resilience. We have much more efficient mobility systems, which more joined together, uh, real-time information coming to people that kind of age journeys and so on. We can move into smart government, so we can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of governance services. We improve uh, smart living, so we improve the quality of life for people, improve their safety, their security, we can manage risk. Uh, and we ourselves get more informed, right? So I've been walking around, uh, around Berlin. I've been using my phone and looking up apps and getting data and seeing what's going on. Uh, and so on. So these platforms are kind of, I guess, enhancing my experience of what's, what's going on, and I can see how long I'm going to wait for a train or a bus or whatever, whatever it might uh, be. Okay, so that's the promise. Uh, and mostly what I'm going to talk for the rest of the talk is about the perils. Okay? Or, sorry, I should also, just before I get to the perils, I should just say that not all smart cities are the same. Right? So this is not a one-size-fits-all to how we go about uh, doing this. So in different countries, there are different kind of priorities around what they're trying to do with smart cities. And even within countries, different cities are trying to do different things. So in Ireland, as I've already said, smart cities is really about job creation. It's about economic development. It's about inward investment. It's about encouraging innovation and startups. And it's about urban regeneration. So in these districts, it's about getting new companies in, regenerating those areas, which obviously also has the effect of gentrification. Okay, so. Uh, in the UK, it's actually about marketization. They've invested into smart city technology because they're hoping to develop the technology to be able to sell to cities elsewhere in the world. This is part of the logic of what they're doing. It's also about neoliberal management of those cities. Uh, it's about marketization of city services, about uh, privatizing city services and allowing companies to come in and run those. In Germany, my impression is it's about efficiency of urban governance and around sustainable growth kind of resilience. Uh, in Spain, uh, particularly in the Barcelona model, it's around deliberative urban de development, so much more citizen participation. Uh, the idea of open and inclusive uh, cities. So they're, they're really pushing things like open source software rather than proprietary software. They're really pushing citizen involvement, developing kind of civic platforms uh, to uh, debate and make decisions on uh, neighborhood uh, change. 
The United States is about economic development, about urban regeneration, but it's also a lot about policing and security. In India, it's a developmental project, but it's also a kind of a nationalist uh, kind of project. If you're, if you're against smart cities in India, you're against India. You're against them being able to come up the development cycle and get modern new uh, cities. Um, and it's about fast urbanization. It's about making a transition very quickly in the same way that China did to very modern uh, kinds of uh, cities. Uh, in China, it's about, it has been about fast urbanization, it's about economic development, it's about population management, and it's also about security. Um, and in the Middle East, it's, it's partly about how do we get to a post-oil economy and also fast urbanization. Now, the images on the right uh, side of the screen there, the top, the top one is dollar uh, in the, in the middle bit, it's how it looks in kind of 2020. The one on the right is obviously not real. That's what it's meant to look like when it's built, okay? The dollar plan was 2015. This is where it was in 2020. This is what it's meant to look like at some point, which is very, very different to our notion of what Indian cities look like, indeed, how they look like. Uh, the one in the top uh, middle is uh, Mazda in the United Arab Emirates. Um, as it was being built and roughly how it looks now, built for 40,000 people, meant to be a kind of very energy efficient uh, kind of uh, building, uh, all autonomous vehicles for public transit and so on. Uh, Songdao, again, is a, so these are, if you like, uh, green field developments or desert field developments. Um, rather than a regeneration of existing cities. So, but the, the bottom one, New York, Hudson Yards development, was a regeneration built above Penn uh, Station, what was the biggest real estate project in the US when it was uh, built, built as a smart development, full of sensors and different technologies uh, and so on. Not cheap to live in, you need, you need a, at least a million dollars to afford an apartment uh, in that complex. Songdao is entirely from reclaimed land. So, 2003, none of that land exists. It's now a city of about 150,000 people on the edge of Seoul and Incheon. Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like uh, now. Again, developed partly as an economic driver within the area, but also to export the technology, to sell the technology to other, other cities. Okay, so the, the perils then. Um, so part of the, uh, the logic of the smart city is to use technology to solve urban problems. Um, and the way that that's framed is it frames the city as a system of systems rather than a constellation of places. So it's not really thinking about the city as a, as a place, as a set of communities and so on. It's thinking it in very instrumental terms around infrastructure or particular uh, kinds of tasks. So that influences how you then go about solving those kinds of problems. It's often framed around a very kind of neoliberal political economy and a corporatization of governance. So a lot of this stuff is outsourced. It's either through public-private partnership or it's uh, through some kind of leasing or it's through outsourcing or whatever it might be. But it's about bringing in companies to help in the management and governance of uh, cities. And this is where things like Google's development in Toronto uh, became problematic because they effectively wanted to run a district of, of the city. Um, and be able to raise things like local taxes and run the kind of local gov uh, governance and so on. So you have companies getting involved in governance and this obviously has issues around democracy uh, and so on and accountability and redress and so on. It sees the city as an accumulation strategy. So this is kind of tech-led entrepreneurism. So you basically take what is a public space and you monetize and marketize it. So you change the nature of uh, the space. It's obviously a very technocratic form of governance. You're running governance off of algorithms and off of data. And it's solutionism in the sense of technology is the solution to every urban problem. Whatever the problem is, we can fix it with a bit of technology. If we have data and some algorithms, we'll fix whatever problem uh, it is. There is issues around um, the idea of citizenship. It very much promotes a neoliberal or a autocratic forms of uh, citizenship, depending on uh, which jurisdiction you're in, so very kind of marketized notions of citizenship. So what that basically means, and I'll talk about this a bit later on, is you are a consumer as opposed to a citizen. It's a kind of consumer rights base, or you get what you can pay for rather than you having inherent rights uh, and so on. And it changes the nation of 
nature of governmentality, because the, the technology changes how, we're, how we are governed in the sense of how surveillance works, but also how decisions are made uh, in uh, relation to us, and that we can't sometimes escape the technology. So the way that a, a person, a, a checkout till, used to be supervised is by a person. Then it moved to a camera, but you didn't know whether anybody was watching the camera or not, so you self-disciplined. Whereas now it's the technology itself that, that uh, monitors your behavior and actually regulates your work. Okay, so the way, the way you do your job is through the till, and it's the till that monitors what you're doing. And if your scan rate drops below 38 a minute, it will tell you to speed up. So the only way you can get your, so this is, this is a notion of governmentality as control as opposed to discipline or other forms of uh, managing people. You're, you're within the fold of the technology. There are issues around to the extent to which these are buggy, brittle, hackable. So all kinds of cybersecurity kinds of issues around this. Loads of cities in the US been held to ransomware attacks where bits of their city infrastructure goes offline or the technology itself gets hacked in some, in some fashion um, and basically put out, of, put out of action. So, all, so what does it mean when bits of our city infrastructure can kind of fold over and what are the implications of that? Um, the questions around power. So who is implementing this technology? Who has control of it? Who gets to decide what the rule set is? Who gets to decide what the outcomes are? Uh, and so on. And is it the companies who design and, tell this this, and sell this technology? Or are they designing to a specification set by us or set by government officials or set by somebody else? Like, are we just buying their rule set or are we still uh, in control of that? And then there are all kinds of effects around uh, social, political, uh, and ethical effects. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of those now, uh, which is based on a piece of work uh, initially that we did for the Department of Taoiseach, which is the Prime Minister's office in uh, Ireland. Um, so there's a whole load of questions here around surveillance and around privacy. All of these technologies are working in real time to collect information at a granular level, and the granular level is you or your phone or your communication. So every piece of email has a unique ID, every phone message, every bank transaction. So lots of things now have unique ID tags tag, tagged to them, which allows very strong resolution on being able to track things. Um, and what does, that, what does that mean in, you know, for places like uh, in autocratic states, for example? Um, and a lot of the literature will talk about places like China and its social credit scoring and its surveillance camera systems and its security systems. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, about some of this a bit later on. But some Chinese, uh, southern Chinese cities now, the way you pay to get on the, on, on the metro is with your face. So your, your face, you scan your face to open the bar barrier to get to, into the station to get on the train. Uh, you can't own one of these without giving a facial recognition scan. So they definitely know it's you who's used the phone and not somebody who's borrowed it. That's a very big implications for our notion of privacy uh, and so on. And who has control of that data? Who owns that data? How can they monetize it? What can they do with it? So all kinds of questions around data governance, data protection, privacy, and so on. Issues around predictive profiling, anticipatory governance. So the idea of anticipatory governance is you, you basically try to work out what people are going to do and police them before it happens. It's how predictive policing works, right? So predictive policing is either about where you think crime is going to happen or who you think is going to commit crime and trying to intervene before it happens. Social sorting is basically using the algorithms and the data to basically decide who gets what, who is deserving or undeserving, what areas get investment, what areas don't, what people get investment, what people don't, and so on. So making kind of decisions around um, yeah, uh, patterns of investment or patterns of uh, welfare payments or whatever it, whatever it might be. Uh, issues around nudge or behavioral change. So a lot of a lot of discussion, for example, around energy is about how do we nudge people to change their, their use or about trans transport is about how do we nudge them to change uh, how they um, do, you know, uh, whether they cycle or walk as opposed to drive and so on. But there are real questions here about who gets to decide the nudge. There's a real, there's a power dynamic in here. How are they nudge? Why are they nudge? What are the penalties if they don't uh, go the way that they're being told to go uh, and so on? Issues around dynamic pricing, 
uh, there's a number of issues, you know, there are a number of kind of companies, we're used to this with airlines, if we all went to the airport now and got on the same plane, all of us will have paid a different price for, a, for the ticket. But what happens if you roll that out to or every kind of good, and how do, again, do we socially sort within that? So who, how do we decide who are the high value customers or who are the customers we don't mind trying to uh, leverage as much money out of because we, we don't think they're going to be a repeat buyer uh, and so on. I've already mentioned data security. And then control creep is technology is designed for one thing starting to be used for another. So I guess a good example of that would be a COVID tracker app in Singapore where it's very explicitly said this will only be used for monitoring health and COVID but has subsequently been used in trials to uh, one high co case profile around a murder trial to prove location of who the perpetrator was supposed to be. So the data got repurposed into a different uh, use. Now we can talk about whether we think that's valid or not, but it depends on what the use case is and how that data gets uh, shifted. So if we just want an example of that in relation to location, if I was to go back 20 or 30 years, if I wanted to track any of you around, I probably would have had to hire a private detective and they would have had to follow you and then they'd been following one of you. With this technology, I can track millions of you in real time with this. Like Vodafone knows where I am at the minute because every four minutes, this phone is telling them where I am. And it's also telling other apps where I've got location stuff on here. So it's telling Google where I am as well because I have that enabled at the minute. So we have real time, so that's how a lot of these COVID tracker apps are working around social distance monitoring, around um, uh, whether, you know, lockdown, whether you were staying within five kilometers of where you lived or whatever, whatever it might be. Okay. So we have things like controllable high definition CCTV cameras, we have automatic number plate recognition cameras, uh, we have smartphones, where the smartphone could be tracked through how it connects to a cell mast, how, it, how the GPS on the phone itself, or how it tries to connect to Wi Fi points. We can have sensor networks. That try to that ping the MAC address off your phone. Okay, so in Lon in London, it's the bins that track you. In Chicago, it's the lamppost that track you. Um, we have smart card tracking, so maybe using QR codes or RFID chips when we tap in or tap out of a of a transport system or in and out of a building. Uh, things like facial recognition payments. Uh, the middle one actually is a bus in China. You scan in the face to get on the bus. Um, vehicle tracking. So ID transponders you might have in your car to so automatically raise barriers at, on, on motorways or at car parks and so on. We also leave uh, kind of asynchronous data points. So when we connect to credit card or when we pay for things or the metadata tagging that we have in photos that then I upload onto Flickr or something, uh, you can track where I've been uh, using that. Uh, electronic tagging, shared calendars uh, and so on. So we have very fine grained detail at the level of the individual uh, in real time where things are. And you can find this out yourself. You can go on Google and look up your trail and it will, you, you can see where you've been for the last year, it will, it will tell you. This is an example of kind of social sorting that's in at the level of the technology, not necessarily at the level of use. So this is a bike share scheme that was put into uh, Dublin. Um, it was put in in 2009, uh, relatively controversially at the time. It was an advertising for bike share swap. So basically, the I'm not sure you can see the purple, the purple squares are illegal advertising by JC Duco, and they would be legalized by swapping it for a bike share scheme. So that they would put in a bike share scheme. The orange colors are basically poor neighborhoods, and the blue colors are rich neighborhoods. And you can see that the poor neighborhoods get got to keep the illegal advertising hoardings and didn't get any bikes and the rich areas got the bikes, because you can't trust poor people with bikes. There's a real question here about the distribution, the fairness of the distribution of who got to be able to use this technology. This is social sorting based on social deprivation. Or, you know, they upgraded the scheme in 2013 and put in a load more bike stations, again, all into uh, the blue areas, into the rich areas. There's a couple in the orange area down on the left hand side, and that's, that's the digital hub. So this, there's actually a lot of kind of startup companies in, in this uh, relatively poor neighborhood that's now rapidly gentrifying. So that was a, a, a kind of a, a link onto that. 
So there are a whole bunch of questions that some of this technology and how the technology is used kind of raised the questions around things, for example, how are citizens expected to act and participate in the smart city? How is public space in the urban commons framed and regulated, uh, particularly if it starts to be privatized uh, and uh, private security surveillance and so on? What, so what sorts of public can be formed and what actions can they take? Uh, well, if you're a student on an American campus at the minute, you can't take a lot of action. Uh, and there's militarized police and uh, various kinds of surveillance uh, going on. Uh, to what extent are injustices embedded into the smart city systems or infrastructures or services? What are embedded into their calculated practices? So what kind of logics and norms are embedded into how the technology is designed to treat people and regulate people? What systems of structures of inequality are re reproduced within smart urbanism? What models of citizenship are enacted within the smart city? What forms of social justice operate? And what are their effects? And ultimately, the key question I think we need to ask is, what kind of smart city do we want to create and live in? And we don't often start from that point. We start from we have this problem and here's a technical solution, or we start from we've got this piece of technology, what problem can we find for it? We don't start from what is the city that we actually want to live and create in and whether, whether technology is or isn't the answer to that. So there's been a whole load of discussion within the literature around recasting the smart city, but trying to rethink it. Now, there are a couple of ways that we can do this. So one of them is very procedural regulatory. Um, so this is basically ethics, interventions, law, technical solutions. So things like, so we're not discounting the notion of a smart city or its normative function. We're basically just trying to put manners or regulation on it. Okay, so this is privacy, data protection, data governance, data security, re-envisaging the smart city so it's fair and proportionate. So again, just trying to put boundaries, put, try to put limits on it. Um, and the problem here is it basically re reifies existing structural relations. So it doesn't, it doesn't try to rethink the normative aspects of the smart city. It basically just says, how can we control the excesses? Uh, and so on. Uh, so it doesn't try to challenge or make us rethink the smart city or its logics. It just sticks some uh, stuff on it. The alternative is we can kind of invert the ethos and use the smart city technology. So we, we start to think around be, it being citizen-centric or social justice, and we start to think of normative terms and moral philosophy. So citizenship, social justice, ethics of care, right to the smart city. And there's a notion of actually rethinking the smart city itself rather than just trying to, trying to put law or regulation around it. And the last one is we just say we don't want the idea of a smart city. Uh, we don't want this technological solutionism. and we want something else. In reality, that's not really an option anymore because there's so much of this stuff already embedded in, and some of it is really useful. Like if you took the intelligent transport system out of Dublin, it would be permanently gridlocked. The only reason the traffic moves is because of it. It's like a 19th century road network that's designed for 25% of the cars that are on it. The only way it can work is with that technology optimizing what's there. It would be a really bad idea to get rid of it. And there are other bits of technology that are uh, very useful. But what it does mean, I think, is having to think about the normative. So what should be as opposed to what has to be. So starting to think through principles, values, and ethos. Uh, so kind of vision as opposed to just meeting obligation, which is compliance. We've gone the compliance route, trying to put these boundaries around or limits on or regulation, as opposed to necessarily rethinking the vision of a smart city itself and its values and its ethos. And that's, in, that's reflected in how we've gone about this. So the, the stuff on the, on the uh, left-hand side is we're basically locating the problem, the perils, if you like. The problem is in individuals and within technical systems. So the fix is ethics about addressing bias, it's around consumer rights, it's about fairness, regulation, accountability, transparency, and so on. And clearly, they're all good things, and we want them. But the argument is we also need to supplement them with the stuff on the right-hand side and acknowledge that there is structural power in here. There is capitalist uh, logics in here. And we need, to rethink, we, we need to think about redistribution and reconfiguration as opposed to just putting some uh, limits or edges uh, on this. So start to think, think through the smart city, through the lens of things like justice, through oppression, through citizenship, through equity, through a commons of public good, through democracy, a collaboration, uh, and so on. And understanding how the smart city fits within history, culture, uh, uh, gov governance, and other kinds of contexts, and not just simply as a set of technical 
uh, solutions. So the technical way we've gone about doing this is typically through like the market. Uh, so we have industry standards, self-regulation. There's a notion that ethics is competitive advantage. So you'll go onto one technology as another because of uh, X kind of thing that they've got. Um, or you try to do end-to-end -end encryption, access control, security controls, privacy enhancement tools. Or you do it through policy and regulation, so fair information practice principles, privacy by design, security by design. You do it through education and training. Uh, you do it through governance mechanisms. So you have vision, you have strategy, you have oversight. Uh, you have compliance boards, you have regulatory boards, uh, you have people doing the day-to-day -day delivery where they, they have to comply with certain uh, kinds of standards and regulations uh, and so on. And this is typically how we've tried to uh, uh, control some of those e ethical kinds of questions, some of those are political kinds of uh, questions. But we could come at this from a more ide normative ideological uh, framing strategies have already said. So we can think about the right to the, to the smart city. We can think about citizenship. We can think about social justice. We can think about ethics of care. We can think about principles, values, ethos, uh, and so on. So the, the, right, the right to the smart city, which obviously comes out of Lefebvre's notion of the right to the city going back into the, into the 1960s, it basically says we should be designing and running cities around the rights of citizens, not around the interests of states or corporations, but what works best for citizens should be our leading question. And how do we enshrine those rights into the everyday governance and management of cities? So, you know, so we, you know, we shape space according to the habitants' uh, needs. Uh, it's not, it's not pre, uh, kind of predominant predominantly set by a political or economic elite. And there's a whole bunch of these rights uh, that, are, uh, that, uh, that exist around right ha habitation, um, a right to participation, self-determination, and a whole load of related rights in like the right to information, the right to free expression, the right to culture difference, equality, self-management, uh, and so on. Uh, and that these are not just aspirational, these are the core principal values of how we run and manage cities and that these should be embedded into the technologies and the logics and norms of the technologies. We can think about what that would mean in relation to things like citizenship. So citizenship defines membership in a polity and their rights, their entitlements, duties, and responsibilities. The initial critique of smart cities was that these really weren't citizen-centric technologies. They were designed by companies looking for a new market to create new profit, uh, to create new profit lines, or they were run by cities looking for uh, particular kinds of solutions uh, to what they were trying to trying to do, and there was a very neoliberal logic in here about marketization, corporatization of uh, city uh, governance. And the pushback was was that they really aren't serving the interests of citizens. So I guess around kind of between 2013 to 15, I think there was a big pushback against the corporate notion of the smart city. But in reality, a lot of what just happened was citizen focused was labelled on, but nothing else actually changed other than the label. So the logics underlying that didn't really alter. Citizens were really a, a kind of an empty signifier. And really what that citizen focus really meant that you were a recipient uh, of stewardship, so somebody doing something for citizens, or civic paternalism, deciding what's best for citizens. So companies or states would do things for citizens or uh, decide what's best for citizens as opposed to it being bottom-up, ground-up, citizen participation, notions of citizen being involved in the design, the thinking, the logics of what's kind of going on. So what that meant was smart cities are actually rarely citizen-centric beyond a quite tokenistic uh, uh, framing of citizenship, often in very neoliberal terms, which is basically where citizenship is raced around individual autonomy and freedom of choice within constraints, and you basically get what you can afford and some consumer rights as opposed to core rights and entitlements, along with associated responsibilities. Now, this is a very complicated kind of table. If you just kind of focus on the two kind of columns that are in, got the yellow at the top. Um, what, we, what we were trying to do was look at these different kind of technologies and kind of say, OK, fine, where is the citizen in this technology? Are they just the person that this, that this system acts on? So they're, they're the data point, they're the patient, they're the, the user, they're whatever. Or, or is there some notion of choice and that they're a, they're a consumer, they browse, they act, they consume? So the bottom one is you're steered, you're nudged, you're controlled. 
Next one is browse, you consume your act. Next one up is cons consultation, you, you give feedback, you give some kind of input into the process of the design or how it's run. Or placation, and you, you, you propose things, you suggest things, you can say, I think this should be changed, I think it should be altered, we should be looking at this or doing this. Or is the citizen actually in this kind of top layer of citizen power where they're actually involved in negotiating, producing, leading, designing, owning bits of technology that operate in their neighbourhoods that directly relate to how they live their lives in their part of the city or in the city more, more generally. And typically, the vast bulk of smart city technology are at the bottom of this table. They're not at the top. And a lot of the stuff we've got at the top are actually just citizen, they're citizen kind of led projects. So around citizen, uh, kind of civic hacking, uh, living labs, uh, Code for Ireland, uh, and so on. Now we could also think the smart city through the lens of social justice. So, you know, social justice concerns expected uh, and acceptable ways in which people are treated and the conditions in which they live. The big problem here is most people just say, we want just cities. We want, we want justice in the city. And that's as far as it goes. The issue is, is there are different forms of justice. And the real question is, is what form of social justice is it that we want embedded into the logic of the smart city? So we have types of social justice, so distributional, fair share, procedural, fair treatment, retributive, fair punishment for wrongs, and restorative, righting of wrongs. So again, we have to kind of think, what type of social justice are we looking for? Are we looking for distributional, so that those bike share schemes go into poorer neighborhoods, for example? We're looking for fair treatment, that people who are being socially sorted have some way of uh, being treated in the same way as other people. But then there's also a philosophical question. What model of social justice are we actually thinking about here? Is it egalitarian, which is e equality for everybody, regardless of their status or power? Is it utilitarianism, which is the greatest good for the greatest number? Some people are gonna have to suffer, but the whole of society will benefit. Is it libertarianism? which is prioritizes individual autonomy over state and society. The free market is inherently just. So I could be a free market capitalist and say, the free market is inherently just. It's natural justice. You get what you deserve. You get what you can pay for. If you can't pay for it, that's your problem. That's just. So when people say justice, I can't, my, my initial response is, that's fine. What notion of social justice are you really talking about? Because I'm pretty certain it's probably not libertarian. If it's not libertarian, is it egalitarian, is it utilitarian, is it contractarian? You have to actually kind of state this. We can't just say we want just cities. It's what kind of just cities? So which vision you adopt makes a very big difference to your kind of ethos or your logics about how you then go to try and reimagine or revision what your smart city is going to do. So the kind of the argument I guess I'm kind of leading towards is we do need a kind of a normative notion of smart cities. We do need to kind of think beyond these very commonsensical, taken for granted, pragmatic, practical, technical, post-political notions of the smart city. Recognize that there is, these are full of politics, they're full of economics, they're full of social cultural relations, uh, and so on. We need to avoid things like uh, citizenship washing or ethics washing which basically means you say you're citizen-centric when you're not citizen-centric. You say, you know, or greenwashing, you say your technology is sustainable, resilient, when it's really not. You, you've said that to try and get some market uh, value out of it, but you're really not doing what you, what you say. And we reimagine, remake the smart city in a more emancipatory, uh, uh, empowering framework. And we, we embed those kind of logics of the right to the city. We think through our social justice, we think through our notion of citizenship, of course, this is really difficult because there's lots of vested interests. So I can wish this, but I can be pretty certain the corporate interests and state interests and uh, the political ideology of certain political parties are going to push back and resist against this. So I could say this is what I'd like, but it's not necessarily what's going to happen, right? And we have to basically fight for whatever vision we think that it should be. Okay. Another step is to think about decentering the smart city, and I'm going to finish with this notion of decentering the smart city. So, so decentering smart cities basically is to try and see through the technology and position it in relation to systems of oppression. So you, you basically try to say, what is this actually doing in relation to people? And is that, uh, and to see how it fits into wider structural relations, that these technologies are part of capitalism, they are part of 
uh, uh, authoritarian uh, political ideologies. They're part of, they're, they're in there, right? And they're part of wider structural forces. So we need to think of those forces in relation to these technologies. They're not just technology, practical, instrumental things. They're embedded in wider structural kind of relations. And we need to think about, are these technologies actually the answer to certain city problems or not? And maybe other things are much better answers, like community development or certain kinds of policy instruments or certain kinds of investments. The technology isn't necessarily always the answer to a, to a problem. It could or it could not be, and it could be in conjunction with other things, but it isn't necessarily always the answer. So this is not about inserting equality justice into smartness, but how smartness might create equality justice in conjunction with other kinds of interventions. So it's not starting with tech looking for a problem or turning to first to tech for a solution, but it's starting with the issue that needs to be fixed and might be fixed through not using technology at all. So we can make an answer, you know, we can make an argument that a lot of this technology is sticking plaster solutions, uh, or it doesn't really address problems. Like homelessness is not going to be fixed with an app. You might be able to make homeless service provision a bit easier with, a, with an app and so on, but homelessness is a problem with deep structural inequality, uh, domestic violence, mental illness, whatever it is, right? It's not something that an app can fix. It can help in some way, but it's not the solution. Same with congestion. The real solution to congestion is to get people walking and cycling. It's not to optimize the traffic on the road network. All the traffic management system is doing is there's a sticking plaster solution to an existing problem. It's not addressing the root structural cause. And that traffic management system needs to be used in conjunction with other kinds of interventions, which may or may not be uh, happening. And things like institutional racism within predicting policing is not going to be fixed with tinkering around with the data and the algorithms. It's about uh, system change within inside the policing system itself. Okay. So, you know, platform and surveillance capitalism are not separate and distinct forms of capitalism. Racism expressed in smart urbanism is not cut adrift from the structural logics and operations of institutional racism. Uh, instead, we kind of frame the smart city technologies and operations with respect to capital and racism per se, but the solutions are anti-capitalist alternatives and anti-racism, in which smart city technologies might or might not be part of the solution. So in this sense, maybe we need to stop thinking about smart cities and start thinking about cities and whether those, these technologies are or are not the most suitable ways of trying to fix the problems within them, as opposed to assuming that they are and going for a very kind of technocratic, instrumental approach to how we address uh, issues which are largely decontextualized from history, culture, governance, politics, uh, and so on. And I'll end on that depressing note. Okay. We're sitting here, yeah. okay. Thanks a lot, Rob, for this uh, very deep and detailed insight into the concept of the smart city and uh, your work. I was wondering at one point, especially at the end, you notice I'm talking a little bit more slowly because the interpreters asked us actually to speak oh, a little bit more slowly for the people with headphones. Since I'm originally Swiss, that shouldn't be a problem for me. Um, let's see where this happens. I thought at the end, is this a rare case of a scientist saying his field should, if not be outright abolished, but then dramatically renamed. When you sort of said that there's no smart ur urbanism, but there is only urbanism. No, it's not that there's no smart urbanism. I just think it's more productive to think of cities themselves and the relations within cities, to think of them as constellation of places rather than systems of systems. Mm -hmm. and. And technology cannot, you know, might not be part of the solution within that configuration. The problem with smart urbanism is it always assumes that technology is the answer. So that's kind of why I've kind of shifted my thinking a bit to say this is really about cities. This is about what, it shouldn't be what type of smart city do we want to live in, it's what type of city do we want to live in. 
that should be the key, the key question, of which these smart te technologies may or may not be how we achieve that notion of the city. But if we, start, if we start with the notion we want to create the smart city, then we've already made the choice that technology is the answer. That, that's an inherent prerequisite decision that we've made. Let's jump to the, I think, about first quarter um, of your talk. Now you're at the very end. Jump to the first quarter where you showed us a system that you actually developed, the Dublin dashboard. Mm -hmm. I think this is highly interesting. I'd like to know a little bit more uh, about that, how you built it, uh, who actually said what's going to be built and where'd you get the data? Let's start with Airbnb. Did they, did they give you all oh, the no, data you that you sort of concentrated there? No, this is public scraped, access? I can't imagine. No, you scrape the data. So we, actually we get the data from um, uh, an organization called Inside Airbnb oh. who, scrape, who scrape the data and then make it open data. That's where we source, <laughs> we source that data. So yeah, that was a project we, we started so, so the Programmable City was my last ERC grant. It ran from 2013 to 2018. Mm -hmm. And um, we made the decision near the start of that, that project that the best way to find out how smart city technology is developed is to develop it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd already been working for kind of 10, 15 years building these kinds of tech solutions, mm -hmm. effectively mostly interactive maps and graphs and so on for local authorities, for, for municipalities. So we had, we had some background, we were already developing some of this tech um, to try and help local authorities understand what was going on in their areas. Very particular kind of issue in Ireland is that Ireland was the last country in Europe to have postcodes. We had a postcode from 2015. So local authorities found it very, very difficult to map any of their data. And so we were, we were basically geo-referencing and mapping their data and producing mm -hmm. these tools so they could see their own their own data. Um, and so yeah, we, we talked to Dublin uh, City Council and the other three Dublin uh, local authorities. Uh, we were already doing work with Ordnance Survey in the Central Statistics Office. And we came to a partnership to basically build, build the first iteration of the, of the dashboard. And then we got a subsequent grant that ran from 2016 to 2020 from Science Foundation Ireland to, to do more work and we were basically looking at the logic of these dashboards. So we were looking at issues around usability, data quality, um, uh, kind of the politics of how they're put together and how they're used, like the choices and decisions made. So, so we knew the politics are going on in the design because we were in the room where the decisions were being made about what data should be shown, how it should be shown, what, what, what the dashboard is trying to do. And so, so we were in those conversations, so we knew exactly. We weren't trying to infer from outside. We knew because we were in the room. And, and Dublin City Council said, well, great, because they basically said, you can write whatever you like. Like, if you critique us, that's fine. We'll just have to learn how to do it better. Hmm. They, weren't, they weren't defensive or try to put up walls to limit the view of what was happening. They basically just say, we need to learn from this. Um, Before I have a very practical question again to the Dublin dashboard, let me just real quick go yeah. back to the notion of scraping data for yeah. a, a European Research Council project. Was that no problem legally? Did Airbnb not sue, sue you after that? Well, Was they'd be suing inside Airbnb rather than us, I think. Okay, uh, so they sued the foundation model, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, don't suggest that to them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't like, think they're watching tonight. Yeah, I mean, tonight, there, there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of politics and legal stuff around the, uh -huh. uh, and there's kind of ethical questions around scraping data and where you're scraping data from. I mean, we're scraping data on a different project at the minute uh, around uh, eviction data and, uh -huh. um, and around land or data and about decisions in tribunals. And we're basically helping out a tenants union try to understand what's happening with, um, landlords trying to push people out of tenancies so that they can raise the rent price. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's a very embedded within a very kind of, uh, I guess, kind of social justice notion. We've done it also in the past. Well, I didn't, a PhD student in the, uh, in the institute did it in relation to um, asylum seeker claims. And basically what he demonstrated was which which person processed your claim made a massive difference to whether you got asylum status in Ireland. There were some, there were some people processing it where only 30% of applicants got 
got asylum or there was some where 90 percent did so who, who you got as your case manager made a massive difference to whether you got to stay in the country mm, sure oh. and he basically scraped all the data and then pulled all the data out to be able to see what was going on so you know there are real benefits out of doing some of that kind of work if you're if you're interested in those kinds of um I guess kind of ethical citizenship, polit political kinds of questions of exclusion and discrimination. I think I remember another tool on the Dublin dashboard that said how long to wait for a hospital bed, right? I think it was another Yeah, that was up there. Is that still in use, actually? Is it. Um... Um, no, the Dublin dashboard is closed down. It closed down in 2020, basically because the money ran out and, um, and the city didn't want to pay for it. They wanted us to keep giving it to them for free. Did people use it in large numbers? Was it something? Uh, no, I don't think that no. they did. And actually, one of the so we did a lot of work around dashboards around usability. And we did a lot of user testing. One of the big issues around dashboards is is people's data literacy is actually quite low, and the bounce rate is really high. So people go on, they look at these graphs and whatever, and they just go, "No, I've no idea what this is," and they leave. Mm -hmm. You know. And so we tried. We we spent a lot of time trying to design dashboards that would work for different types of people. So we, we had a we basically if you landed on the on the site you would be directed into either data stories, um, data I can't remember what they were now data tasks and data something else and basically one you got the graph and you also got some text and the graphs were kind of put into a story structure so it kind of told you the story of housing or told you the story of transport or whatever, um, but the, you got text that basically interpreted what you could see. Uh, you could just get an ordinary dashboard and like maybe what a policy maker might see, you might have a bit of data industry. And then we had one where uh, data tools was the last one. And we gave the uh, people the ability to be able to basically make their own visualizations, make their own. So these are kind of power users, people who have a lot of data literacy and they, they, they want to play around with the data themselves and make their own things. So we were trying to find ways to cater for different constituencies rather than a one size fits all dashboard. You know, um, so part of our logic Part of our logic of building the uh, of building the technology was we were we were trying to build it to destroy it to build it better. <clears throat> so we were trying to do we were trying to think through issues around data quality, around data access, around the ethics of how the data might be used. Because you you can use these dashboards in a very kind of performance management way. So in a lot of U.S. cities, these dashboards would be used as a way of monitoring staff performance. So it would say. So say in Baltimore, there's a weekly meeting of, of, in a, a purpose-built dashboard room where each of the section managers in the municipality will be shown their previous week's data. So if you're in charge of roads, it will say, you only filled 90% of potholes last week that you were meant to fill. Why are you not meeting your targets and what are you gonna do to fix it for next week? So it's done in a very kind of managerial performance way. That's not how it's done in Dublin. It, they, it's used much more contextually. In fact, most European city, cities will use it much more contextually to just try and understand what's going on in the city. They don't use it in a performance management way. Mm. So you, you can use these dashboards in very different kinds of ways to do different types of work. And so we were trying to think through the ways in which they might be used, trying to think through issues of data literacy, trying to think through design issues, all those kinds of things. Mm. And also the politics, the politics of the data and so on. I think many people actually appreciated it if you did this in Berlin, Rob. I think you could become a rich man here. Uh, building the Berlin dashboard. Um, no, no, you de no, no, that's definitely not the logic here. You should, uh, as a university person, uh, whatever, this should all be open source and over the data and I should be monetizing <laughs> any of it, right? Like, this is the, the logic. And that's actually why the dashboard changed a lot. So our ethos was it had to be open science it had to be open data. Hmm. All, all the dashboard code is there. You can go and you can go and download all of our dashboard code off of GitHub, and everything. We just we just shared the lot. Oh. Yeah. You talked. You had this beautiful chart on cultural differences. What smart cities mean in different countries, or just different, mm -hmm. you know, um, even cities actually. And it seemed to me that all of the priorities you listed on on, on this chart. Uh, were sort of, I thought, were top-down priorities. This is something yeah. a government or... With, uh, with the exception of Spain, really, which is really Barcelona and some of the other Spanish cities, yeah. yeah. Well, would you say that is true, that actually the people invest I think that's where much the, time and money in our priorities yeah, I think that's that where have the, been decided 
on the top level, yeah. meaning on a government level. Yeah, I think, well, that's the logic of where a lot of these smart city offices and municipalities came from originally. So mm. a lot of them go back 10, 15 years. So they're, they, a lot of them predate this kind of turn to sit towards the citizen-centric. I mean, there are, there are cities that tend to prioritize the citizen-centric, so Barcelona is the classic example. Um, where they were, if you like, the poster child of the neoliberal smart city up until mm. 2015. They, they had a change of government into a socialist-led government. Um, they decided not to jettison the idea of the smart city. They decided they would reframe it. So they decided they'd move from proprietary software to open software. They would move to open data, and they would move to citizen bottom-up. And they developed things like the, uh, the CDM platform, so this is like a civic participation platform which works at scale and you could have tens of thousands of people making choices and decisions. So you, you might be, and it could be very mundane kind of things, you could be given in your neighbourhood you know they're going to put in some new bus stops. You can vote on which of the three designs you like best or you can vote on which design of a new playground you like best. And so you can actually have tens of thousands of people potentially voting on things that are going on in their neighborhood or within the wider city. So they try to kind of get this more, I guess, uh, citizen engaged kind of notion. Now, the seeding platform has been adopted by a number of other cities around Europe. It was a European funded They also got uh, famous kind of people to help them, right? Like Yevgeny Morozov, I think, was involved at one yeah, time there. Yeah, or Francisco Bria was yeah. the kind of the head of their kind of, the, they, they kind of formulated this notion of technological sovereignty. So this was embedded into the city's kind of uh, city council's ethos. So the notion of technological sovereignty is the technology must serve citizens first, not profit, not necessarily the state, but citizens first. So if it's not serving the citizens, why is the city investing in this technology? What, you know, why are we trying to foster the use of this technology in our, in our city if it's not going to enhance what's going on within a neighborhood? That was, so yeah, they, they, they kind of, formulated and then promoted this notion of technological sovereignty. You talked also about ethical issues mm -hmm. or uh, things that sort of tie in sometimes with what you call the perils of the concept of the smart cities. Mm -hmm. And one of the sort of precarious, I think, uh, ethical issues was nudging, behavioral change or mm -hmm. behavioral control. Now. In this series, we've had people talking about China, we've had environmental scientists that said, well, nudging could be a good thing. Yeah. It can be a good thing if we wanted to re reduce the carbon footprints mm -hmm. uh, of factories. That's done in China also, we mm -hmm. were told uh, yeah. um, back in the day when we had yeah. people talking about China. Uh, if you talk about um, sustainability, if you talk about you know green consumerism, whatever that is, uh, which mm -hmm. is certainly a form of nudging and a sort of, you know, uh, Mm. inciting behavioral change and so forth. So there's a lot of good to be expected from nudging, actually. Where yeah. would you draw the line that the nudging is so something governments shouldn't do? Like the real question with nudging, basically, is is the power relation within the nudge. So it's who, who decides what the nudge is, how it works, who should be affected with it, and then what the penalty is if you don't do what the nudge tells you to do. Mm. So that's the, that's the real issue. Now, the China case, for example, they do do it for corporations. Mm -hmm. So on, they, they have basically corporation credit scoring. Yep. So if you're not meeting pollution targets, you're not meeting recycle waste targets, you're not meeting whatever, then there are penalties to the company. You can't bid for government contracts. You can't get involved in some procurement contracts. You can't uh, expand your business into certain other districts or whatever, right? There are consequences for not meeting these kind of targets. But that also works for people. So they are doing social credit scoring at scale which basically means if we were in China, we would all have a score. And that score has a real consequence to you. It decides where your kids can go to school, where you can live, whether you can travel long distance on uh, flights, whether you can leave the country, whether what university you can go to, whatever, right? So your score matters. Um, so there are penalties and there are consequences for not doing what you're nudged to do. So if you, if you act in a way that the state thinks is, it says is antisocial or it you know, goes against the ethos of the state or whatever, there is a, there's a direct consequence. So you, you live within a, uh, you know, a system that has consequence. So that's, that's the issue around 
that kind of technology. Now they would say that the technology is good, and in fact there hasn't been massive backlash in China against the technology. Um, partly in the way that it's been sold and indoctrinated over, over a, a period of time. But it, the, the logic is, is that this gets rid of corruption. You basically get treated on the basis of your data. So if you're a good citizen, you'll get rewarded. So you, you only have to worry about this if you're a bad citizen, of course, depending on how we want to define bad citizen, right? And this gets rid of local corruption, or corruption within police, gets rid of social networks. This becomes much more about meritocracy than around network and contacts and uh, you know, backhanders and whatever else. So it's sold in a way that, you know, as long as you're doing what you're doing, there's nothing to be fearful of it. So there's not been like a big, necessarily a big backlash or protest because you're social. But if you go to Hong Kong, they are definitely protesting about it and have been, right? Like, because they, they don't want that technology to come in. Mm -hmm. and, they, and part of their protest was actually to do things like cut down surveillance poles mm -hmm. and come up with ways to try and circumvent the technology. I've learned one term uh, tonight that I think is going to be, you know, from now on, immediately part of my active vocabulary, and that's uh, citizen washing. Uh, I've, I've heard of greenwashing, of course. I've never heard of citizen washing. Uh, I found that highly um, interesting. And, you know, coupled with that, of course, is uh, the term uh, citizen-centric uh, mm -hmm. that you uh, advocated for. And I'm wondering, what does citizen-centric actually mean in a time where cities change so dramatically because of the housing market, because of gentrification? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you know about what's yeah. happening in Berlin in pretty much yeah. any other uh, major European city, uh, mm -hmm. that what is to be a citizen kind of radically changes right now, yeah. uh, who is you know, able to afford to live in an inner city yeah. and thus uh, have the right to say something yeah. about what is citizen-centric, how is the smart city going to change because of their needs of the people who can afford to remain in the city. So I thought, yeah. what's yeah, your take real, on that? I mean, the real issue, I think, around the citizen-centric uh, citizen issue, I mean, there, there are all kinds of issues around participation and actually getting people to really get involved and become part of trying to contribute. Like, there's a reason why we have representative democracy is we vote for people to actually go and do this work for us we don't want to be involved in every decision in the city, right? We delegate that, that's what. You know, so there, there is this kind of question around that. The second is, there's a notion in which it's inherently progressive. So if citizens are involved, it will be, it'll be a good thing, but not if all your citizens are on, say, the far right, and their agenda is to capture the technology so they can exclude and discriminate people. But it is still citizen-centric because it represents their views, right? right? So. You, you can't just assume that citizen-centric means progressive, social justice, ethical notions of the city, because people will uh, use the technology as they want to use it. They'll repurpose it and reuse it to, to deliver what they want. And this is one of the big problems to say collaborative planning. So kind of collaborative planning technologies in the US in a number of cities was captured by the Tea Party or the Republican Party and basically used to um, stop investment into black neighborhoods or to stop uh, uh, certain kinds of infrastructure spend, to stop investing in public transit, to, you know, so this, the, basically the planning system got captured by a particular group of citizens involved in, because uh, you know, planning works on the basis of we can give our feedback in, we can see the plan, we can see the five-year plan, we can say what we think, right? Um, so that's, you know, we can't just assume it's an inherently good thing. We have to kind of think through a bit more how that works, I think. So let's open this up. Um, maybe we'll start with the room right here. We have two microphones, Sarah and Lara, where are you? Okay, we've got two. Let's start in the back, right there, maybe. And then I got you. And the front row. I got three people already, that's very good. Please. Yes, very interesting conversation, very interesting talk as well. Thank you for that, very dense. Um, I was um, kind of stumbling over the notion of constellations uh, in contrast to systems. And I was just mm -hmm. curious if you could elaborate a bit uh, what you mean with, uh, with this notion of constellations uh, and, and how, how it uh, is set apart from a city as a system of systems. Yeah, so a system of systems basically is, is it's a... I guess it's partly around infrastructure, but it's partly around rule-based systems of how you do governance or how you manage infrastructure. 
uh, and so on, and it tends to work everywhere the same in a way. Whereas a constellation of places, I mean, you could use any word other than constellation, it's really places versus systems. So places, um, the problem with systems is, is they really don't deal well with things like politics, with history, with culture, with context, with contingency. It basically has a rule set and works in a very particular kind of way. Um, and cities are very diverse. They're full of wicked problems. They're full of uh, contestation. Uh, they're not, they're actually really difficult to model and to run as, you know, at one level we can think about them in a cybernetic way, but in another way it just doesn't, when it gets down to the messy realities of lived life, they don't, the, the models don't quite work, right? There's, uh, uh, because of what they, what they exclude, they can't include every variable and they can't include whatever. So, so, so I, I think it's quite different to think about places and neighborhoods and communities and culture and politics than it is to think about systems and rule sets. I think it's just a different way of thinking. It's almost like the difference between urban studies and urban science. I mean, that is, that's, that's the difference between those two fields, if you like. There was a gentleman, I think, fourth row from the back. Mm -hmm. There he is. Thank you for your question. Um, hello, thank you. Um, my name is Aurel. I'm an architect, a data scientist, and I work for an engineering company that um, also builds dashboards, digital twins, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question for you, and uh, maybe you can help me sort out a kind of uh, dilemma that I have with the work I'm doing. As with all technology, there is always the possibility to use it for, let's say, the good or the bad. And in this particular case, dual use come to mind where maybe the military has already developed a far more sophisticated version mm -hmm. and my question is how can we make sure that what we're proposing for the civic society cannot be misused and cannot be put to that let's say military use mm -hmm. in a european but also in a, in a very in another difficult really content it's, it's very difficult to stop repurposing and reuse because once it goes into the wild, you know, people will pick up and use technology in ways that you don't anticipate and so on. And lots of technologies get repurposed around, around those kind of things. I guess the only kind of thing you can really look at is, um, <laughs> is kind of regulation and rules and laws that say, like the COVID tracker apps in, in Europe had that law around it through the European uh, Data Protection Board basically said this can't be repurposed. Like you can't, you can't take the health data in here and then go and do something with it afterwards. It all has to be deleted after two years and the apps have to be turned off after. You know, so there was a regulatory thing put around some of the COVID technology to stop. Now, that doesn't mean, doesn't mean that those technology, and you know, in China, a lot of that technology stayed in place. You know, scanning QR codes to get in buildings, scanning QR codes to get on and off buses and so on. That, that stayed in place. In other places, it was removed you know, things like having to do a QR code when you were checking into a cafe or a pub or something. Um, so, yeah, it's, I guess kind of regulation stuff. But you're right, like, a, there is this kind of overlap with the military technologies, and loads of technology we have in our everyday life has come from, you know, military use, you know, all kinds of stuff, like microwave ovens. You know, microwave ovens was basically the solution to cooking stuff on, on nuclear submarines. That's why they were invented, you know. They, you know, so there's, there's loads of stuff around that. I remember being at the Smart City Expo in Barcelona and talking to somebody about their smart city system and kind of saying to them, I can't remember which company it was now, but I kind of said to them, you know, where, where does this technology or, or originate? And he said, this is what we use to run the Iraq war. And we just remarketed it to run a city. And that was the origin point for that company. And they were just, they were looking for a new market for existing technology, that's what they were looking for. In fact, a lot of the technology stuff there was already existing technology that was trying to find a new market, was, was my impression. But yeah, it's very difficult to put limits or boundaries around how people will take your tech and do other stuff with it. Yeah. Other, other than you can maybe put rules in the licensing. If you have licensing, you can put rules in the licensing that says you can or you can't do this with the data or whatever. Well, with a lot of 20th century technology, it was actually the other way around, that the military developed certainly yeah. a lot of entertainment uh, technology, yeah. like valves, headphones, um, 
yeah, effects yeah. for the voice and so forth yeah. that came out of the radio, yeah, yeah. actually, was yeah, a military invention. All the kinds of stuff like space, a lot yeah. of it comes out of space technology, sure. you know, things like Teflon and stuff, that's all comes out of space stuff. Jeanette, in the first row. Then there's a gentleman in the back, and I got you. Yeah, thank you very one. much for this interesting okay, talk. Um, I've been wondering about the motivation or expectations that drive cities to adopt um, smart city technologies. And I asked myself whether it could be sort of instances of um, isomorphism that cities, for example, think in order to be cool, they have to sort of uh, adopt this mm -hmm. kind of technology, meaning that they might not even have a clear vision of mm -hmm. why they adopt this technology, mm -hmm. to what purpose to adopt it, and how they should make use of it. Mm -hmm. So since you've studied many cities, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I haven't studied many cities. My, my main case study has been Dublin. I've spent most of my, Dublin and Boston are the two that I've looked at in most detail. I mean, we, we have a paper called The Accidental Smart City, which is, the, which is Dublin, basically. So in kind of 2015, they basically looked at what kinds of these technologies have we got, and then they tried to put a frame around it and a narrative around it. So what had been a very ad hoc roll out of these various technologies. They try, so we, I think the paper's called From the Accidental to the Articulated Smart City. So they tried to put on a narrative around something that had been very ad hoc in how it had actually uh, developed. And they started to put a vision and a strategy around it. And that vision basically was, how do we get FDI and startups into, into Dublin? How do we, and they looked at these test bed districts and they looked at you know, other kinds of stuff. And actually, the citizen ethics stuff, which they actually do reasonably well now, that was the last part of that. And they probably only did it because they were under pressure from people like us saying, when you enter into these contracts around procurement by challenge, part of what you should be assessing is, what are they doing with it? Are you actually asking them, what are they doing with the data? Or what are they doing with the technology? And how are they deploying it? And are you, are you actually going and looking at how they're putting this technology into these districts or not? Have you spoken to any people in the community about the fact that they're now living in a testbed district? Which they did two or three years after the testbed district was up and running. They finally got to talk to the citizens in the area and say, oh, by the way, you're in a testbed. You know, so, yeah, I think um, often there wasn't, I think it depends on the city and it depends on the governance and so on. So some. Some cities took a very proactive, this is how we want to kind of develop, linked in with political ideology. You know, like the UK government, for example, they put, a, put together a big pot of money and they got cit cit cities to bid for the money to create these smart city programs. And they were basically trying to create a market for the technology, as well as creating a test bed. So they were, they were trying to make a market happen by seeding that. And a lot of what the European Union is doing is that. So a lot of the European Union funding around smart cities, you have to have a, it's often like a, you know, one of these quadruple helix things, you know, you have to have a, you have to have a city government, you have to have a company, you have to have a university and you have to have a civic organization. And you have to have it in three or four different cities minimum across Europe. And they're about providing a roadmap and a, and a market for the development of these new technologies. And so if you're a city looking for money, you know, smart city is a way of getting EU money, basically, you know, and you can get quite a lot of money. If you were a lighthouse city, you could get, you know, six to 10 million euros worth of money coming in to look at something. In the UK, like Glasgow got 24 million pounds sterling as part of the seed funding. And basically what they did was they built a big surveillance center and uh, a control room. That's what they put their money into. Whereas Milton Keynes put all of their money into uh, transport, transport solutions. So like electric vehicle infrastructure and all this kind of stuff. Aut autonomous cars was the kind of the space they, they went into. So yeah. yeah. Okay, we've got three more speakers here in the room, but real quick, I would like to check if there's anything on Slido. It's for the people on the screens at home and also for people who 
uh, don't want to speak up in the room. Everybody wants to speak up in the room tonight. That's great. So uh, let's stick to the room then for the last three questions, I would think, before it's time for snacks. We have snacks tonight, don't we? Outside? Yeah. We do. Okay. All right. Please. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for your uh, for your talk. Um, I think we've actually met a year ago during my Viva. Um, and I guess you've provided extremely helpful feedback, so thanks again for that. But I guess I have two questions. One would be conceptual, and the other one, I guess, if you like, more empirical. The one on, on conceptual would be, what's your understanding of space? I mean, you, you talk of mm -hmm. the city as a constellation of places. You've, yeah. from, you've, I know, obviously, you've written this book on code space. But have you thought about sort of conceptualizing urban change through space? And have you thought about, let's say, different spatial figures sort of colliding, overlapping, and so on? And the second question would be on, I guess, I guess more like sort of general reflection on what's happening right now in particular, obviously, the student protests happening in the States, in the UK, but also in Berlin. What's the role of science in, in shaping um, cities, especially universities? Um, so these would be my two questions. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the last question is really a very is a is a more political question around protest and uh, and around the right to free speech and so on within within the university. So, I'm not I'm not an expert on that. I'm not going to propose to try and cobble together an answer, other than I think that the students should have the right to be able to pe peacefully protest without a police, certainly not a militarized police intervention and a heavy-handed intervention. I think people should have the right to be able to voice their, their political views uh, peacefully. The prior question around space, I mean, I've, obviously, I've spent quite a bit of time kind of thinking about space. So you mentioned the Code Space book. Uh, I mean, you can think about space, in, as you say, in different, in different ways. You can have an absolute or relative notion of space. You can have you know, different ones. In, in the Code Space book, we forwarded the notion of an ontogenetic conception of space, which basically it's, it's, like, it's like the production of space. So space isn't kind of a fixed, uh, static thing, like a X, Y, Z geometric kind of notion. It's something that's actively produced and managed and created by people and lots of other things, right? And it doesn't stay still. So it's always in the process of happening. It always needs processes of maintenance and care and repair, and it all, it's always changing, right? So, so. And we were interested in the notion of how software, at that time we were mostly dealing with software rather than data, how algorithmic processes changed how space was being produced and the difference it made when it didn't work. So the example that we typically would use to illustrate, that's the airport. So an, an airport is a really strong code space. If the software stops working, the space can't be produced as intended. So a check-in, you can only check in electronically. There's no paper check in any longer because you, you can't do any of the security checks. You can't do anything. So, if the software doesn't work, it just becomes a waiting room. It's not the space is not produced as it's intended to be produced. So we we had the notion of code slash space because they're di they're diactic. The code has been produced to create the space, and the space doesn't work if the code doesn't. Or at least the space does work. The space does work, but it's produced in a way that's not intended to be produced. Whereas a coded space would be like the room we're in now. Like if, the, if these screens stop working, I can still give the talk. The space is still produced as a lecture and an and a, you know, interactive discussion and so on. The technology is not fundamental to what's actually happening. The same in a supermarket. If the till stops working, it can't function as a shop. It's just a warehouse. Because the only way of processing payments, in fact, the only way to know how much things cost if you're sat at the till is if the software is working. You can't process the payment, you can't, you don't know what's going on, right? So, like, it's totally dependent on the digital to actually function. So that's, that's for me, the notion of, like a, like a software produced space, if you like, and that space itself is produced. So this does have an X, Y, Z coordinate, right? But it, 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 it changes, right? The city changes, it's always evolving, it's always, take, it's always taking place. So that's my notion of space. It's not as an ontology, as something is, it's how something becomes. That's why it's ontogenetic as opposed to an ontology. So hopefully that makes sense. We're also being live streamed tonight, so there's another uh, actually dimension uh, yeah, of the yeah. space that is not only geometric. Tonight we have two more questions and a 
10 minutes before we have to shut it down and I have one last question. It's always the same, the regulars kind of know it. Uh, we have the third row here in the, yes, please, the microphone. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, your arguments, and thank you for reflecting on a student protest. Um, I have something that I'm, is question slash comment. In the very beginning of your presentation, you talked about different um, regime of a smart cities, and then you put countries, UK, mm -hmm. US, Spain, India, and then Middle East, like it's, it's one country and it's, it's like one smart city regime. Um, and then you put the picture of a smart city that is happening, I think, in Dubai. Um, but the thing is, um, mm -hmm. Dubai or uh, what is happening in a smart city regime in Riyadh is um, yeah. quite very different from yeah. other countries in the Middle East. For example, Lebanon, yeah. a smart city regime is not answering to the mm -hmm. post-oil economy or a smart city regime in mm -hmm. Iran is not answering to the fast mm -hmm. urbanization. That, that was kind of a yeah. more comment. Yeah, so, I mean, that's my point, really. My point, my point is there isn't a one-size-fits-all smart city. That what's actually going on in different places is contextualized by that place, by its, by its political regime, by its governance structures, by its laws, by its culture, by its society, by its social norms. Like, all of these things shape. That's why the smart city, say, in Berlin is not the same as it is in Hamburg or wherever, right? Because people have different priorities about you know, so I mean, it's one way. Another way of thinking about this is we could have a, we could have is the smart city serving corporations, states, citizens, and you could think about the mix. So in Dublin, you might say, I don't know, it's 40% 40, 40 companies, 40% state, 20% citizens. In Barcelona, it's 50% citizens, 25% work time. So you can think about the mix of like, or who's providing the solutions. So you know, which is often to do with how like uh, um, uh, like how government works and the extent to which they outsource stuff. Like in the UK, there's some, there's some local authorities in the UK where they're basically contract managers. They've contracted out everything. The bins are delivered by one company, the buses are delivered by another company, the lampposts are main, maintained by another company. All the local authority does is manage the contracts. The whole lot has been corporatized, marketized, outsourced. The, the, the state itself doesn't deliver any service. The hospital is run by a Chinese company. The nursing home is run by a French company. The, you know, like it's, uh, whereas in Ireland, that's not the case. The state is running a, a significant portion of services. And if it's not the state, often it's civil society. So it's, it's uh, civil society organizations, which is linked into the history of the country. It was like, like Ireland was a really poor country up until the 1990s, right? So the civil, the civil society sector was really important to delivering services. Like schools and hospitals were run by charities. That's how, that, that's how it was worked, right? It wasn't a private sector delivery of those services. So that, that, that has then an imprint as to what goes forward. So every, every, every city on the planet has a different smart notion of smart. There's no one size smart city. I think that's the key. That's why I had varieties of smart urbanism. And we have to understand that when we, when we kind of think through and theorize this. Yeah, we should do a whole evening on what's happening in Riyadh, for example, the speed of which uh, um, they are sort of putting up a whole new city or a, a whole new smart city, I found mind boggling. We have one last question uh, here right on the left side before we wrap this up. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Michel. Uh, I would like to actually share a little uh, experience of uh, me from Smart City of Berlin, or, or the Smart City of Berlin. Actually, all my friends are using Google Maps to find local stores in the city, like coffees, restaurants, whatever, and the decision to go there is based on rankings and reviews, like mm -hmm. 5.4 or 5.6 mm -hmm. stars. And on the other hand, we have the local ranking algorithms of Google that are secret. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, thanks to clever CEO, uh, SEO agencies, we know that they are based on uh, mainly filling out your Google business profile and doing mm -hmm. SEO, uh, like uh, spending time and money on your online presence. Yeah. So I have the feeling 
it's not a smart city. The people are navigating here through Berlin. It's more like a, a milking, uh, like a data milked city. It feels. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know what you think about that. Yeah. So I mean, that's I haven't really talked about kind of urban platformization in a sense. So urban platforms. So. Um, yeah, they're kind of missing from the talk in a way. So there are these very large uh, global corporations who are who are doing that, like the Googles and so on. And then there are smaller local startups and so on. And obviously, recommender recommend systems are important in you know how the algorithms work. And that's social sorting, right? So there's social sorting going on, looking at your profile and then maybe trying to predict where you might like to go and giving you recommendations and uh, kind of yeah nudging you towards certain places. Uh, and so on, and that's and that's often the smart city that we're encountering. But that's the smart city I've encountered while I've been here. I've been using my smartphone to look stuff up and to do stuff. And you know, I put, I could probably use I I don't know, but I could probably use it to pay to get onto things or to enter into things or do whatever. Um, so yeah, that that kind of urban platform thing has become a de facto smart city in a lot of places. You know, and that can have really marked impact on cities. Like, so um, you'll you'll all be aware that there's a number of cities who push back against Airbnb, for example, or push back against Uber because they radically disrupt how kind of uh, accommodation markets work or how taxi markets work. You know, they they kind of come in, disrupt things, and then you have to try to work out how to regulate them afterwards. Um, but that's often the way that we encountered the smart we don't often consider them smart city technology but they they are in the sense that they they mediate how we experience the city and how we understand and engage with the city yeah berlin has pushed back some of airbnb uh, at one yeah. time um, and regulated that and that's my last question i was talking about just a minute ago we always like to talk about regulation at the end of the series because that's a uh, well, not a genuine European stance, but it's a very successful European stance. Mm -hmm. If we took a look at the globalized tech race, so to speak, with the mm -hmm. uh, you know export model of the GDRP, of course, and now the Artificial Intelligence Act that is being uh, watched closely worldwide, uh, I believe, at the moment. And uh, I don't want to really talk about the AI Act in detail now. Uh, that would be a whole other evening, but what is being regulated right there is implemented two years from now. There's still a lot to be done, but it went through European government in March. Um, is actually quite far-reaching, and of course it is centralized. I mean, mm -hmm. you can do some stuff differently in certain nations. That's, you know, uh, mm -hmm. has, has, to, has to be negotiated now in the next two years. But still, my question would be, um, if we talk about recasting the smart city, if we talk mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, citizen centrism, um, what that means, is there a way of regulating certain excesses, which are actually being regulated in the AI Act, yeah. so some of them are, but yeah. would you say it's a good thing to regulate that on a European level, on a national level, or on a citywide, more bottom-up uh, sort of level? What would yeah. you think would be the best way to start Oh, that? I don't know. I think it depends on the technology and what's being done. I mean, I quite like it being done at a European level, mainly because Irish lawmaking is so weak and poor. Uh, we 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 rely on EU passing things that then get pushed down to us and we have to do. If we were left to do it ourselves, it would never happen. Um, so for us, the EU is really useful in that sense. I mean, the GDPR is kind of interesting because it does, it does force companies from outside the European Union to have to adopt the, uh, the GDPR to be able to trade in Europe. So it does have that kind of effect. But there is a kind of a, like a standards war going on, for example another part of regulatory kind of space of standards around technology. I think there's a big battle going on between kind of the US, China and the EU in that space as to how, you know, and a lot of the technology, the AI technology is coming out of China, for example. Um, and maybe they're not necessarily coming into here, they're going into other parts of Asia and they're certainly going into places like Africa and so on. So the, there is a, the, I think there is a kind of a global regulatory battle going on in the in the in the digital uh, in the digital space and it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds over over the next while um, 
I mean, local laws, I mean, obviously a lot of cities have tried to, do, to tackle things like Uber through local laws as opposed to national laws. The problem there is you, you end up with a differential effect within the same national jurisdiction. And I, I, you know, my preference would be, personally, my preference would be to do it at the national level um, because it means all citizens within the same jurisdiction or have, have the same rights and entitlements and the same protections or the same workers have the same protections. You know, so I don't think you can, you know, I don't think you can regulate, for example, the gig economy at a city level. All workers within this jurisdiction should have the same rights, regardless of which city they're in, within Germany or within France or within the UK or whatever. So I'd be quite wary about local laws on technologies that work at the scale above. So there is always this problem of scalar scalar effects you need you need the law to be operating at the right scale and if you don't you know and if you don't then you have a mismatch and you get you get disparities yeah but as you said uh, what happened with the gdrp also now with the ai act it forces american companies to actually adapt yeah. to the ai act if they want yeah. to be available only, and as only, you said trade in europe but only for the bits they trade in europe so for example like in india for example there's been pressure within India to try and get Indian companies to uh, use GDPR in India, because the Indian companies are only using GDPR in their trade in the EU, but not locally. Mm. You know, so it doesn't, it doesn't mean, it just means if they want to trade in the EU, for part of that business, it has to comply. But it doesn't mean it has to comply when they're trading elsewhere in the world. Mm. Oh. You know, so it's, uh, it, does, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean that the GDPR forces GDPR globally. No. It only, sure. only for when they trade in Europe. Sure, sure. And I'm sure it'll be the same with the AI Act. Yeah, it is the same, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So now we're going to get extremely local. Uh, our snacks and our bar are not on Instagram, they're not on TikTok, they're not even on Google Maps, but they're right outside here. Uh, for you now, thank you for bearing with us for such a long time. Thank you so much. Please, a big hand for Rob Kitchen for coming to us from Maynooth University in Ireland. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.